My, na my name is Wei Li Chong. I'm the Executive Vice President of Human Resources for Knowledge Universe, and it's certainly my pleasure to uh, take you through the next hour in such an expansive and, and meaty topic related to competition globally and, and some of the talent challenges that we're facing today. Before I introduce our esteemed uh, panel, I'd like to just ground us with some, some relevant statistics to, to get us uh, started this morning. Uh, in a recent Wall Street Journal report, in 2012, 284,000 college graduates uh, had jobs that were paid minimum wage. And while that's less than 2010's high of about 327,000, uh, it still represents 70% more college graduates uh, working for minimum wage than, than a decade ago. On the flip side, uh, as we've all been reading about the challenges related to the shortage of talent, uh, specifically in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or commonly referred to as STEM talent, the President Obama's uh, Council for, for Jobs and Competitiveness believes the mismatch between skills available and available jobs represents as much as one-third of our current unemployment rate. And finally, as companies begin thinking strategically about the changing and, and traditional uh, models of talent infrastructures and, and how they build uh, cultures and corporations that can leverage uh, talent, in a recent study with the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, where they spoke to more than 400 global leaders uh, and asked them to name primary shortages of, of management level and, and specialized uh, um, issues uh, related to this topic of, of competition. Three of the top four areas of concerns were related to uh, cross-cultural cross -cultural agility, uh, limited creativity in overcoming these challenges, and the limited experience with truly becoming a multinational organization with the challenges that we face. Uh, so this is such a relevant topic given where we are uh, as a country uh, and certainly as global um, uh, nations begin to compete on, the, on this global scale. So with that, we, we do have a, a great panel for you today. Uh, what I'm going to do is introduce them uh, to you and have them each speak to you in terms of what global competition for talent means to their business their industry. We'll talk a lot about the trends and the challenges, but most importantly, we want to give uh, exposure to some of the solutions, some of the ideas, and some of the initiatives uh, that these individuals are leading to really change the, the shape of uh, the challenges that we uh, face ahead. Uh, so to my far right, we have Bob Bennett, Chief Learning Officer and Vice President of Human Resources for FedEx Express. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Uh, we have John, sorry, John, Jim Corcoran, I'll take that. Uh, uh, head of global recruiting for J.P. Morgan Chase, Jody Greenstone Miller, who is the founder and CEO of Business Talent Group. We have David Ford, uh, Vice President Human Resources for North America for Sanofi, and last, Sanjan Pillai, who is the CEO of UST Global. So welcome, everybody. So Bob, if you'd like to start. Uh, when you think about the global competition for talent and, and the vast range of, of topics that fall under that umbrella, what, is it, what does it mean to you and, and uh, the issues that you're dealing with at FedEx Express? Okay. First, a little bit about, very quickly about myself. I've been at FedEx for 34 years, started out as an engineer and been in every job, just recently got into HR, chief learning officer there. Um, FedEx has been around 40 years. It's a global company. Everybody knows it. It's one of those companies that we're very proud that has turned into a verb and not just a noun. Um, uh, so we're in some pretty good uh, com uh, company with that. We serve over 200 countries um, globally. Uh, we have, um, sir, uh, out of 375 airports, we have over 300,000 employees uh, across the globe, employees and, and partners globally. Um, we've been involved, we, for the last 10 years, we've been named uh, great places to work globally as well as domestically, um, Fortune 500 and all. Um, we are a very, ver very diverse organization, as you would expect, based on the size of the organization that we have. Um, I think um, probably the, the issues that we have, because we, we are founded on a uh, policy of people service profit, which basically is take care of your people, 
They'll, they'll provide the service to your customers who in turn will provide the revenue for us, which then is re reinvested back in our, peop in our people. So it's a, it's a cycle of life for those of you who uh, movie uh, folks. Um, and part of that philosophy is a promotion from within. Um, when, when you come to FedEx, the reason I'm here 34 years out of the 40 is because when I came in, they provided an environment that worked for me. Um, that, and, and I'm probably one of just the normal um, hundreds of thousands of employees that stay for the rest of their career there. We have a very diverse workforce. As I said, we actually ha are involved from the STEM type employees, senior executive type em employees, all the way down to the handlers, people who come in and, and just move packages, and all those in between, um, special skills, um, uh, maintenance, et cetera. So we have a broad view of this. I would say that probably to, to wind this up very uh, quickly, there are five things that we, I think, are influencing us that we are very much aware of. One is the globalization issue. Things are happening quickly and all the impact with globalization, I won't go into that detail. The second is the generational concerns and the different types of people that are coming into the organization, what it takes to make sure that they're uh, incorporated and continue the legacy of the company. Um, the third would be the technology side and how fast and how rapidly things are moving. Um, the fourth side would be the social media and that's, that's um, not only for recruitment, et cetera, but it's also for the brand and reputation of the company, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And fifth, um, possibly the most important, is the education side, uh, particularly the education that's being uh, generated throughout the U.S. Um, so cut to the chase, the big thing for, for me and the big focus of what I think uh, is FedEx's concern is that you can copy somebody's processes, you can um, duplicate um, their services or products, but you can't duplicate their people. And that's what the important part of the, of the um, search for talent management is all about. Great, thank you, Brian. Jim, same, same question. Yes, so uh, interesting, I have very uh, similar background. I'm, I'm, I've been with uh, J.P. Morgan Chase for 25 years. Um, I'm a product of internal mobility, really good internal mobility. I spent my time in marketing and out in the branches for many years, and then eventually through product management and then into um, human resources just in the last eight years. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's good that we have a culture that's internal mobility uh, focused. But, you know, we, we have 260,000 employees, 61 countries. We, my recruiting team this year will fill between 75,000 and 100,000 roles globally. About 40,000 40, of those have come from the outside. I mean, it's, it's massive. So we bring in talent in 61 countries, 40,000 worth. 20,000 of those will probably be in the branches, but then, you know, in the U.S. branches, but then you think about that's 20,000 um, globally um, coming from the outside. And, you know, six, it used to be a little more U.S., and then we, we moved to a 50-50 uh, a blend, U.S. and outside. Now we're probably 60% North America. Just in the last couple of years, we've been bringing a couple more um, roles, especially around technology, back into the United States. Um, Technology-wise, it's a great topic for me. If we think about it, 20, we have 26,000 technologists at the firm. You know, so 10% of our workforce is technology-based. So my team, 11%, 10, 11% of the hires they'll make this year from the outside will be technology-focused, and that's rising every year. Um, so you know, these these two topics, you know, developing local leaders um, and technology, and what to do about the technology talent coming in, just so critical to us. I think it is the number one challenge that uh, from the local leader standpoint, it's, it's, you know, every one of our regions has a, I would say STEM, you know, shortage is probably everywhere, but it's probably not number one everywhere. And that's why it's important to hap, have local leaders that understand what's going on in the region and, and aligning human resources with the line of business managers much more closely so that we understand where we're going in the next five years. So that's, that's really been our focus. Um, for the last year or two and then moving forward as well. That's great. Excellent. Thank you. Jody. So um, I'm going to come at this from the talent perspective and what's changing in the global talent world. And it's quite dramatic. Um, my angle on this is through the prism of high-level talent, people who are top executives, top consultants. And what we see globally is that there is a dramatic change in the way talent wants to work. 
and the more talent is in demand, like the STEM talent, and the more leverage they have, the more they're able to exercise those desires. So what do they want? They want to choose who they work with, what they work on, and when they work. And that's what's been driving many of them to go to an independent professional life. And if you look at the figures in the US, we're expecting over 20 million people who have college degrees and above to be, by choice, independent professionals. So that will have dramatic implications on the jobs that all these folks are doing. And understanding what's driving these people to this, and then ideally, figuring out how to institutionalize some of those desires into the companies to allow them to be desirable places. So that's, I think, one really profound change. Um, I think the second profound change is what I would call the democratization of knowledge and talent. You've got expert networks globally. You've got crowdsourcing globally. You've got things like Mechanical Turk and Odesk. You've got LinkedIn. There are many, many ways to attract and find talent solutions to work problems. And I think we need to widen the aperture of what it means to go after talent and how we structure work and how we solve the problem of the way work gets done. So I think there's a, a bigger picture that's really being driven by the choices of talent and what they want to do and how they see the world. And the third thing I'll comment on is um, what I see in the millennials and women, um, two big groups that I know all of these folks need to attract. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot written, particularly about women. I mean, women are going to be over 50% of the marketplace, and as we all know, in the U.S., they are getting a majority of the advanced degrees. I know this isn't the lean-in panel that's down the hall, but I do want to make a comment about that because I think, you know, God bless Sheryl Sandberg. There are a lot of important points in her book, but I got to tell you, the reason there aren't more women in the senior executive levels is not a lack of ambition. It's because they don't want to lean into the world they're being asked to lean into. And until business understands that and really makes some changes fundamentally in the way that their companies are structured, and there's some very specific things that I'm happy to talk about later, I think this problem will not go away. So to me, I think the interesting angle is what's talent want and how do these companies adapt to those really, I think, quickly emerging changes. Thank you, Jody. David. So a couple of words about myself. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for Sanofi in North America. Uh, Sanofi is one of the largest uh, life sciences and healthcare companies in the world. Based out of Paris and France, we have around 115,000 employees globally. Uh, in addition to the core pharmaceuticals business, we're active in, in vaccines, uh, in rare diseases with the acquisition of Genzyme in 2011. Uh, consumer healthcare products, animal healthcare products, and of all of our peers in the life sciences and pharmaceutical space, uh, the largest uh, company in emerging markets where we've been present for a very long time. So like most of the companies in our industry, we've been wrestling with the challenges of a massive expiration of patents for our pharmaceutical industry products that's really taken place over the course of the period from 2011 through to now and up into 2015. And the strategy that we took as a company to address that was really to diversify the businesses that we were in. So we've made a series of investments over the course of the last four years to really widen the base of what our company does so that we're not as exposed to the loss of patents uh, which can become uh, a dramatic and almost extinction level event for a company like ours unless you've managed to hedge your risk in that way. So in terms of what are the challenges that we face as a company, the biggest one really is how the research and development function will look and how it will evolve into the future. And it's no secret that the traditional methods of pharmaceutical companies for pursuing R&D have become less and less successful over the years, down to a number of factors, one of the which is uh, increasing concerns around the safety of pharmaceutical products, but also because in many cases, the medical advances of the last 25 years have really provided solutions to a number of issues that were uh, serious mortality risks in the past and now are manageable as chronic conditions. So the question is, how do you make the next generation of pharmaceutical products? And most thinking around that is that 
These will increasingly be complex biologicals. They'll be produced by processes like translational medicine, all of which are more complex and are going to involve companies like ours in much wider collaborations with academia, with clinicians, and also the representatives of patient groups so that what we're producing as a company is really meeting fundamental needs and that we're able to identify those as best we can. There's also the need for leaders that are really able to integrate the thinking around what it means to be leading a business that is much more diverse uh, and much more complicated than it once was in the past. And I guess the third thing would be a challenge which is common to, to many of the people that are talking here today, which is how do you compete and win for the talent in emerging markets? Because it's that local insight and local knowledge of market conditions that's really going to lead a company like ours to be successful in that particular competition. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sajan Pillai. I'll give a, a little bit of uh, background about myself. Um, I'm a founder of a corporation called UST Global, headquartered in Southern Orange County. Uh, we started 14 years ago. We do information technology services for Fortune 500 firms. Um, I come at it from a different perspective. There is uh, logistics companies, there are banking companies, life science companies, and talent companies represented here. This business that I have was born out of a need for um, talent arbitrage. Uh, in the global talent world, when you, in the late 90s, we looked at the advent of internet and figured out that one of the killer applications of internet could be the integration and application of global talent. There is tremendous amount of hot spotting demand, and there is tremendous amount of hot spotting supply. And connecting the pieces really will create the new wealth. Um, so that was the premise of a business. <clears throat> and um, as we started growing uh, this business, one of the things that we found was the employable talent in different theaters were becoming less and less available. Uh, contrary to popular belief, um, com countries like India and China, as many of you are doing business there, you will find the available talent and usable talent shrinking rapidly while the demand is exploding. So, so then we looked at uh, two aspects and said, listen, first of all, in the global talent war, you got to do two things. One is you have to create global talent. Human capital, human resources is not talent, and talent is not global. So that transition from human capital to global talent, somebody has to really apply uh, resources and focus to create global talent. That's number one. Some corporations are in that game, some corporations aren't. Some countries are in that game, some countries are not. Number two is once you have the global talent, you have to fight for them, you have to attract them, you have to retain them, you have to grow them. So we got into uh, looking at these issues in a very uh, interesting manner. Uh, after being in India and Philippines and the U.S. markets for a while, we said the world, we have to look at explore the world market. So last year, uh, we went to Mexico and partnered with uh, the previous president of Mexico, President Vicente Fox, and said <clears throat> there is immense potential for human capital development on information technology and other knowledge economy talent in Mexico. Yet it is heavily underexplored. And because of branding problems, because of commitment problems, and because of policy issues. So, you know, somebody has to start the process. I committed through our non, uh, nonprofit foundation to train 30,000 Mexicans on information technology and hire 10,000 of them, making Mexico one of the largest information technology centers in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the uh, current administration under President Pena got on board. And they have done a number of things uh, to help us. But the fact of the matter is, in less than a year, in less than a year, we are already the large, one of the largest information technology companies in Mexico. And next year, we will be one of the largest in, in the continent of Latin, Latin America. And I took this model to many of my Fortune 500 clients and said, listen, there is a, there is a way to develop talent if you go about it in this manner. As soon as we did this in Mexico, uh, the Saudi government looked at this model and said, why can't, we come, why can't we do this in Saudi? Well, the problem in Saudi, as you know, um, is 1.2 million highly educated women. They can't work anywhere because they can't drive to work. <clears throat> it's not that they don't want to work. They can't drive to work. They can't be outside the social system. And we said, well, that's not an issue. 
the knowledge economy jobs are extremely fungible. We need to have the commitment to figure this out. So we figured how to launch a training program in Saudi for 30,000 women. And as we are in the process of doing that, we got a call from Greece. The Prime Minister Samaras from Greece said, listen, Greece has 12 million people, even though I told some of the panelists that the unemployment report is about 39 to 41% unemployment, which is staggering. His view was the actual unemployment is much worse than that, it's 72% because of underemployment issues. So we, he said, how can you replicate this model in Greece? So on July 15th, we are launching a similar program in Greece to train 10,000 Greek citizens on information technology and hiring one third of them, 3,000 of them. Um, as we were going around that path, we found that UK, of all the countries, Prince Andrew called us and said, listen, we need to do something in UK. And you would think, why? Why would you want to do this in UK? Because there's so many programs going on, the problem is the same. Um, so we're looking at how to launch ra rather a little smaller, but still about 5,000 people trained in information technology in the UK. And the reason I mention this is we also find very similar trends. A lot of global companies look at the global talent market, particularly companies that are headquartered in the Western Hemisphere, because the global talent is global, you know. Says, you know, I would really love the way you are when I'm done with you. They want to change the local customs and local psyche of talent so that that fits into corporation. That really doesn't seem to work a lot. Okay, so that's number one. And number two is a lot of corporations we find try to go into these global markets trying to get the best people. Well, that definition is a little tough in, in a lot of global markets. So we have been advocating the shift to not just getting the best people, but to get the best out of people that you've already hired. That's a little different focus. So. This is, there are some learnings that I'll be very happy to share with you, but um, I'm excited to be in this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjay. So let me shift a thought uh, a little bit. And, and Jim, we, we had a conversation about uh, J.P. Morgan Chase obviously attracts uh, people that want it to get into the financial industry. And, and you talked a lot about how it's a challenge to position the company to attract technical people. Uh, tell, tell me more about that. Yeah, so we, um you know, we, we hire lots of people out of colleges, um, at universities, um, in, in multiple areas of across the firm. But we recently, um, we recently the HR team went out, out west and we visited Google and Apple. We wanted to figure out in LinkedIn how things are done. They're, they're the ones attracting, they're the ones we're competing with, right? We, like I said, you know, 10% of our hires this year will be technology. We have to, we, we have to get in on this game. We're a technology company. So what we, what we started realizing is what, what they want, what they're looking for, the millennials especially coming out, is the ability to work on several different things, right? To, to not be tied down to any one product, project or product. Um, and so what we've started designing are, are programs where they can have all that. Like you can, you can come into JP Morgan Chase and work in the digital platform for a year, and then we can move you over and you could you know, start developing trading um, platforms and that that seems to be interesting to them right so that's you know I'm not going to get tied down to any one any one um, area you know and that I think that was the the thinking why why would I join a, a bank you know why would I join a bank I'm a technologist and I want to move move around I can go and, and work in these other cool areas and and do multiple things and so we've learned that and so that's what we're doing I mean we're bringing in over 500 uh, interns in technology this, this summer will take on 560 uh, new analysts um, for, the, for the new program next year. And, and we're trying to, to do that. We're, we're also just, you know, even you know, my own example is uh, in preparation for today, I was just thinking, you know, what do I know about millennials other than what I'm hearing? So I just sent out a, a note to 10 or 15 HR analysts that are all just starting with us for the first year. And I was just blown away with what I got. You know, I got, they, they just like immediately put down everything they did and sent me back like two pages a piece on what, what, what I should be talking about, what I should be thinking. And it was just, they felt so good that they were asked to do this kind of stuff. And I think that that's what they're looking for. You know, they're looking for engagement um, and they're looking to, to just be a part of the process and not just take a job for what the job is. 
And I think we have to learn that. We have to actually market that. You know, to, to I think, if, if I may, um, I think that kind of ties back to what Jody talked about when she first started. In my opinion, there are really four key things people are looking for when, they, when they're coming to work. Um, first of all, I think everybody just wants to make sure that the basic needs are covered. That, that's a given. But I think the three key important things is they want to make sure that they're working for a company that's valued, that has a reputation that, that um, uh, they want to be associated with. Um, a second thing is they want to be able to work on something of value and be able to produce and make sure that they are contributing to the organization as well as to their own growth. And then the third, uh, the fourth item um, is really they want to feel valued themselves. And I think if you address those regardless of which, if it's a millennium or a, a Gen X or, or what have you, those are the, really the four key things that need to be focused on. And I think that kind of ties in with what you had talked about, Jody. It, it does, but I think it's, I think it's necessary but it's not sufficient, right. and I think that right. exactly. the um, you know I think what you're seeing you know, the average tenure of executives today is what four years now. I mean the the you've got a combination of really wanting to exercise different kinds of work patterns. Exactly what you were seeing at J.P. Morgan, where they want to go from project to project. They want to constantly be challenged, and they want to decide. I don't like that guy over there. I don't want to work for them, or I don't want to be on a plane you know, to Timbuktu tomorrow for the next five months. I want to make those choices. And so companies have to, as much as it you know, may not please the old style of employee relations, you know, you've got to understand that if you're going to keep these folks, you're going to have to change what is normal, and you can't penalize them for it. You're not going to be a B player because you want to work 20 hours a week if you're doing A work. You know, when you do those high potential grids, I've sat through many, many Fortune 500 companies that do those grids, and it's always one of the factors. Well, think about the people who you're keeping out of your, you know, development process. And so it's a really a different mindset, I think. And the other thing that I think is the other half of the equation is the, um, I think just the, the change in the relationship with employers and employees. You don't expect to be at a company for 30 years. You don't expect loyalty. You're going to be subjected to a layoff if things get bad. You know, pensions are at risk. Healthcare may no longer be with the employer down the road. So the things that have tied employees to employers traditionally are being diminished. So if you have pressure coming from what talent wants and pressure on the other way because the relationship with the employer is being diminished, what you're going to see is a proliferation of a hugely, I think, efficient global talent market that will be fast, it'll be targeted, and once folks can feel with confidence that they can have a stream of project work, I think the whole game is going to change. I think to a point that we observed something very interesting when we were in Latin markets, especially with millennials, they want, they want to shift from leadership selection to leadership election. They want to have a vote in who they want to be led by, which is very difficult for corporations yes. to comprehend. So that's one. And the other thing is they, the, the millennials do put an unusually high degree of emphasis on reputation capital. And uh, it has to be genuine. It has to be authentic. They really look at it. For example, when we are bringing in talent to work at some of the largest companies in the world, they're not that much dazzled by the size of the company as much as what they do. They really pay attention to that. And I talk to many CEOs and head of human capital development of our clients to say, pay attention to this. This is, this is going to be the way of the future. Yeah, I would, I would change the wording of what they do to who they are. Yeah, that's right. Because I think that's more important than necessarily, probably more important than, than what they do. What they do. Yeah. Yeah. David, when you, when you think about the work that you do globally, and there's so much that has been written about uh, the U.S. and some of the change, uh, challenges related to uh, skilled worker visas, quotas, those types of things. How, how, is, how does a company put that into perspective when they think about global talent and, and trying to get localized talent and so forth? Where does that come into play in the, in the overall strategy? No, it's a great question. And I think um, like many of the companies in our industry, you have to be present in the US if you're serious about research and development. I mean, this, this is still the country that really leads the world in terms of innovative scientific discoveries. But one of the things that is clear is the relative gap between the US and the rest is narrowing. And you really see that in a number of ways. And I think one of the ways in which we're experiencing it 
is the science in our industry is changing dramatically. I mean, in, in very simple terms, from a very strong emphasis on chemistry in the past to a very strong emphasis now on the complexities of human biology. And so for a company like us that really needs to be able to produce innovative new products as its lifeblood, we've got to be able to access talent that can take us forward in that space. And we've looked at finding innovative ways for our people inside the organization to be much more collaborative with partners outside of the organization, be it in academia, be it practicing cl clinicians, be it advocates within patient groups. But at a fundamental level, we're confronted by a challenge of supply. And that supply really comes down to how many people are coming out of colleges with STEM degrees. And there was some interesting work done by Boeing where they basically were able to identify that of four million kids entering kindergarten every year, less than 5% of those kids will come out with a STEM degree, which in terms of the dynamics of the labor supply is, is a disaster. So we would really advocate that there's got to be a much stronger push, even than has happened to date, in making those kind of STEM careers and studies much more attractive to a much wider group of people. Because when you look at the participation in STEM, not only are the absolute numbers small, they're increasingly white and male. And when you look at the demographics of the population, uh, again, that's swimming in the wrong direction. So I think we need to look very strongly at what can be done to make that an attractive avenue for people to pursue in terms of their studies. But also, in the very short term, uh, we need to be able to bring people from all parts of the world here to be part of the research teams because in terms of pursuing science uh, in, in our industry, there's a very strong emphasis on clusters. And you look at places like New Jersey, you look at Massachusetts, you look at North Carolina and the San Francisco Bay Area, and you've got the infrastructure of people and collaborators to make science happen. But when you have something like the, the H1 visa cap being set at 85,000 per year, and being exhausted in something like two weeks of a given calendar year, it's very difficult to really say that we're able to bring the best and the brightest to work as part of our collaborative organizations. Sanjay, elaborate on some of the things that you spoke to in localized markets and, and how potentially Western companies are, are viewed globally in some of the work that you've done. So I think um, a very interesting question, uh, really, the, the, the whole management style that um, global corporations have had in the past vis-a-vis -vis globalization as we will build products or services in their headquarters or and then they sell it globally that has changed um, you have to they have realized that the consumers and the producers and the distributors of the products and the services they have is all global so really they have to integrate that much more closely uh, than ever before so when I look at it, it, you know, it follows the principles of social, local, and mobile. Um, corporations have to have a social cause when they're entering into a large market. Uh, whether it's India, or whether it's China, or whether it's Africa, or Latin America, they need to connect with something that is important um, from a social perspective. That's very, very key. And the second thing is you can't really use your global brand to attract and keep the talent necessarily. It's important to keep it, but it's not sufficient. So you have to localize, uh, localize your brand. For example, I'll, I'll compare and contrast two companies, uh, Pepsi being one, and I would name the other one. I would not uh, name the other one. But when they went to India, Pepsi had a campaign, and India, had, India has about 24 local languages. In every newspaper, Pepsi had a, an advertisement ad for talent in local language with local characters and local names. And the other company, equally big and larger, would advertise in English with the photograph of a Western, uh, you know. Now, who do you think got the maximum response? Very simple, right? And th this talent war went on for three years before the competition figured out they should do something. So that localization is very important. The third aspect is mobility. And what I mean by that is not mobility of employees, per se, mobility of jobs and work. Right. 
by forcing people to create social displacement by coming from rural areas to cities or from cities to US and UK, etc., that's only a very small part of the equation. Can you shift the work? Can you make the work mobile and take it to where they live? And uh, and, 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 and not create social displacement. So the children and the parents and the grandparents can be together. It's a big deal. And those companies that have those three principles in the, at the core of their talent strategy seems to be winning out in the marketplace. Right. But let, me ask, let me ask Jim. So uh, to Sanjay's point, we see companies moving away from expats, uh, business leaders uh, less qualifying for a million mile frequent flyer miles. So talk about J.P. Morgan's Chase perspective on localizing leaders and, and how does that impact uh, your, the company's ability to stay focused, uh, maintain culture, and all those elements that traditionally was housed uh, in a very uh, centralized place? Yeah, so we, um, we, we, you know, we had an expat strategy for many years. We still do, right? So you know, to, to set up operations in an area, um, you have to rely originally you know, bringing the talent from the, the corporate center out to the country and, and setting up shop there and then hiring locals. Um, what we're realizing now is um, more, more about finding that the next level down talent, the aspiring talent, and investing in, in them and bringing, bringing them now. So what we're trying to do now is bring some of that talent back to the corporate office for maybe six months, right, so that we we bring, we bring that culture into the corporate culture. We get them to figure out the dynamics of, what, of how the place kind of operates globally at the center, and then after six months, take them back out to the country and then, and then bring it up that way. Because that, <coughs> relying on the expat, um, is just, it's just not sustainable when we're growing as much as we're growing in all these countries. And then we're also, you know, many, many, much of our talent is localizing as well. They're, they're finding a great place, and they're becoming local talent so they're they're able to succeed there but it's been a it's been quite a shift for us um right. to do it that way yeah. Jody, question you you said something to me before which i found very interesting uh being an hr guy uh you talked about your business model and you said yeah we we don't go through hr we we, we go to the executives we go through procurement well, i was la i was laughing you know basically what we're, what we're doing at the highest level is building a global marketplace of the best immediately available independent talent at a high level and aggregating the demand on the project side so we're creating a market that didn't exist and what we discovered early on is that the people who really got what we were doing and needed us, particularly because we started in the recession when no one had any budget for permanent mm -hmm. hires, um, is it, with the executives. They were the head of strategy, the head of biz dev, the head of corp dev, the, the division manager. And so we have spent a lot of time and invested a lot in making sure those people know about us. And in preparation for the panel, I just said to my biz dev team, Here's what I'm on the panel with, you know, have we done anything with any of these companies? And we actually have, you know, talked to senior executives at every single one of these companies, and you know, the heads of HR have absolutely no idea. And it's an interesting um, <laughs> it, it, you know, and it, it is a terrifying <laughs> thought. And and you know, I said sometimes we get bumped to procurement, which is also death, but that's yeah, a whole nother panel. Um, <laughs> you know, but so the procurement's starting to understand what we're doing, but you know, HR, it doesn't fit into the traditional role of HR. Mm -hmm. And HR today, and I, I, ha I was saying to Wiley, I, I really seek out HR executives who are forward thinking and, and understand this because I've always believed that if HR embraced not just what we do, but you know, there's a whole world out there of alternative routes to great talent, which is becoming more and more populated with the people you want that you would be incredibly valuable to your executives and you would be bringing them ideas and tools that they don't have today. And so um, it's just, you know, I think it's bubbling up inside your organizations but may not have, have hit your radar screen in, um, in quite the, the way that I, I think it probably will shortly. Um, so. Especially after this. I'm not naming any names. Yeah. But, you know. You're gonna, you, know, you think procurement's tough. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, you, you recently published an article through uh, Harvard Business Review of the rise of, of the super temp. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, question is, so 
aside from some of the capability and traditional views that functions have in companies, what do companies just do wrong? When you, when you think about your workforce that are, is attracted to independence, uh, what can companies learn about that? And what, do, what are they just doing wrong? So here's a, some interesting just anecdotes. You know, I interviewed someone for our talent pool last week who was a very senior marketing executive at major, major companies you would know. And she's been doing independent talent. She wants to work full time. These are not people who want to work less than full time. And I should say most of the independent talent market is male. 70% male, it's not women. Um, it tracks the MBA pool. Um, so I said, why are you doing this? You know, why do you like to do this? And, oops, well, not us. But we'll just, so, so I, I, what she said is a, a, a common theme. This was kind of what she said. She said, I hate bureaucracy. I hate politics. I just want to do my job. I want to make a contribution. May I have your attention, please? Our hotel response team is investigating an alarm that is sounding. Please remain calm. We'll notify you with further instructions. Thank you. But, uh, but it puts in perspective the discussion of talent. <laughs> That's right. The hotel response team is investigating the alarm that is sounding. Please remain calm. We'll notify you with all further instructions. Thank you. I'm sure it's a door. But, but it's a common theme, and, it, and this is something we wrote about in, in Harvard Business Review. I mean, talent, particularly high-level talent, want to do a good job. They want to focus on the work. And I think companies sometimes forget. I mean, you hear about a lot. You, you promote the people who are really good at their job and then make them be, become managers, which they might not be good at at all. And you know, that's an extreme example that everybody knows. But it happens, even though we know it, it continues to happen. So creating paths for talented people to continue to do what they're good at, but still rise and still feel like they have an opportunity to stay in the company as a leader, I think is one of the things that companies don't do right. Um, and I think understanding that, um, that people can make contributions without doing it the way that everybody else does. And valuing that genuinely is another way that people get really demoralized, you know? And this gets into the flexibility issues. Um, so I think that, you know, really changing the mindset about, and you're going to have to, by the way, this is all going to happen whether you like it or not, because the baby boomers are retiring. You don't have women working the way they should be working. There are talent shortages. You're going to have to figure this out. But those who figure it out in advance will be much better off in winning this war for talent, I think, because um, the, the, the world is ripe for companies to step in and, and make some changes. That's right. So Bob, FedEx Express, so known for culture, CEO started by handling boxes. How do you feel about this globalization, uh, these, these challenges, localizing market? When you think about maintaining your culture, uh, succession planning, and all those efforts, how has it changed your view of, of taking some of those challenges? Well, I think, I think that it's, it's a broad, integrated approach that we've been using on this. Um, I, th I think there are, if I could kind of go back to a few things that Jody said and, and kind of get into the, your question. Um, uh, I do think that businesses have to change. And I think part of the problem with HR right now and with HR going, wow, look at what we're doing, um, they caused the problem in the first place because human capital was an easy commodity to have. And we didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to think ahead. Now that the issue's here, we, ha we are being forced to look at and take on new roles and responsibilities that we never had before. Strategic workforce planning, continuous learning within the organization, succession planning, um, the integration of talent management and um, performance management, and all those things have to happen together. And that's really the focus, I think, that we're doing and working on. Uh, at, like I said at the beginning, at FedEx, because we're, we're we're based on an, uh, on a promotion from a within policy. We need to make sure we go out and get the right person on, at the beginning, not the right person with the talent to be the executive leader or the high technical person right away. The person who has that talent, who has that ability to fit the culture, to learn, and to be agile. Okay, um, and going back into my engineering phase for a minute, go back ten years. Woo -woo. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've just done a, 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 not an official study, but a, a study with a number of different companies. And we looked at an average organization. Average organization, they said, performed anywhere between 70, 80 percent. Okay? And they said there's about 10 percent were the hypos. And they said they worked at about 125 percent. 80 percent was about the average. And then there was about a 40 percent down at the bottom. Okay? 
And um, to drive home that point about the high potential and the focus on high potential, if you focus on the high potential and you can get them to 150%, which is what they said that they thought it would max out, it would raise your overall company performance from 80 to 83. Mm -hmm. If you worked on the bottom four, just got them average, it would raise it from 80 to 85. If you, raise, if you focused on the middle section, it would raise it from 80 to 88. And if you just worked on your populations together, it's 80 to 95. Every single section of the population of the workforce uh, provided a greater benefit for the focusing on their development and their talent than if you just focused on hypos. And that's a, a, huge, um, uh, a huge thing I think that has been overlooked by many companies. I want to get the right person right now. High potential is not getting the right person right now. Potential by definition is something that's promising. It's not here yet, okay? Um, what you really need to be focusing on is getting the highest potential out of what you have. Great, great. Jim, so much, um, we've talked about millennials attracting and, and managing talent. Um, Yahoo and, and Best Buy got a lot of visibility because they <clears throat> started to move away from flexible work arrangements. Big, big mistake or? I, I, probably a big, I would just say a big mistake to, to be so vocal about it and so, you know, opinionated about it. I mean, we, I, I think it's, we, we got to figure it out, right? Because other companies are figuring it out. I mean, I, in my own team, I have, in New York, I have 150 recruiters and we're just about ready to take them all out of different offices and bring them to one recruiting center. That will be bench seating, no cubicles, no offices. And I realized that, you know, I'm going to be asking them to do a lot. You know, there's a lot of people in one room. And then, so, so I look at that and I say, okay, so if, if they're there collaborating together, because they need to collaborate, you know, for four days a week, the fifth day off or fifth day working from home is easy for me to do because I know I have them in the room collaborating for a couple days a week. And I just think it's, it's examples like that where we have to just be clear. There's, there's times for collaboration. You know, when we asked those, it, that article, that came out when we were in Facebook with the HR team, and we asked them about it. And they, they were very clear. They, they don't really get into it too much. What they find is they've created an environment where, where people want to come to work. They don't, you know, and they don't have to, right? They don't have to. They can work from home. They have, but they want to come to work because they get to collaborate. And I think that's the, it's the customization, I think, that we have to figure out and, and just be able to provide that. Because they, everybody wants flexibility, but flexibility is defined in a lot of different ways by them. Yeah. David, in, in pharmaceuticals, how do you balance the, the career paths, as we talk about growth, between uh, functional expertise and leadership? How are you faced with that challenge as people want to grow in their careers? Uh, that's a great question. I think within pharmaceuticals as a whole, the, the big trend that's happening in all of the large companies is that the models of business are diversifying. And I mentioned in our company, we've made investments in Genzyme, uh, in rare diseases, in Marial, an animal health company in the last uh, three to four years. You look at our peers, Novartis spent more than $50 billion to acquire Alcon. Uh, an ophthalmology company uh, in 2010. And if you, you repeat that across all of our peer competitors, you'll see similar kind of things. And what that really means is that it, it won't be possible to grow as a leader in a company like ours in a vertical in the future. It won't be possible to become an expert in one division and then rise through the organization. You'll have to be able to develop an expertise in different lines of business, different functional areas, different cultures, and the people that rise to the top in, in our industry in terms of leadership are really going to be those people who've got the ability to integrate different ideas, different perspectives, and to be able to bring people together around ideas. That's what we really require going forward. Excellent. So Jody, I, I picked up no passion whatsoever around women, women in the uh, workplace. Uh, so let me ask you about that. Um, as you talked about it more and you've, you've written a lot of articles and you mentioned Lean In, um, 
What's your perspective on, on advice as, as women begin uh, faced with these challenges and it becomes a hot topic? What's your perspective on well, that? Well, I, I want to just tie it into the comments about flexibility because I think you have to distinguish between flexibility, which means, you know, if I have something to do in the morning, I can do it, and absolute quantity of work. And I think they are getting blurred in, in the world. And you need to understand that, yes, everybody's going to want flexibility. If you're working 80 hours a week, you need flexibility. But there's a group of people, many of them are women, but not all of them, who also value a job that's 40 hours a week. And so you have to look at the absolute amount of work that a particular job requires. And you have to be willing to think, and by the way, I think a lot of jobs today and a lot of titles today are already undoable. You know, and one of the things I'm always fascinated by in a global, fast-paced, technology-based world, you know, you look at a lot of the responsibilities of individual executives, and it's not doable. And so they could work every waking hour, and they're still not going to do it. They're triaging. They're putting things away. So let's be honest, and let's take the title and the traditional hierarchy approach that we have to really an organization, and let's talk about what work actually needs to be done start developing projects and teams, staffing them using all of the various sources in the world, not just traditional permanent hires. I mean, this is not a new idea. Tom Peters wrote this in Liberation Management about 20 years ago. And it's just taken, I think, quite a while for it to come to fruition. And um, you know, so I, I believe that you've got a huge opportunity to rethink how work gets done in a way that allows people who value flexibility and value different kinds of work life, <laughs> even if they're very talented and very um, senior, to accomplish that. And again, I think if you're going to attract women um, to the workforce in the levels that we need to attract them in order to fill these jobs, and if you're going to keep them, we're going to have to restructure. And I think it involves you know, as I wrote through the Wall Street Journal, I think there's sort of four things you got to do. You got to take away arbitrary notions that a full-time job is, you know, 40 hours plus a week. I just, you know, just get rid of that because it isn't. You can do a lot of good things in 20 hours a week with the right person. You got to projectize as much as you can. You've got to differentiate between availability and and you know actual working 24/7 and be available 24/7. <laughs> I think a senior executive needs to be available, and I think they understand that. But that doesn't mean their absolute work is like this. Um, and then finally, I think it is recognizing and treating people properly for the quality of the work, not just the quantity of the work. And I think all of that will go a very long way to um, truly opening this up. And um, you know, I wanted to, to Sanjay's point, I, I totally agree that um, the ability to train to match workforce needs is critical. And I think companies like yours are absolutely well positioned. I know, I've talked to uh, the, the head of manpower who told me, we know every job that opening in the world, you know? What we don't know is how to train people for them and, and who's got the economic incentive to train mm -hmm. because, you know, actually it's companies like yours. And so the fact that you're doing this to me is, is phenomenal. And so, so I think, you know, women, men, I actually don't think it's all that different. I think we need different models and different paths and different ways to accommodate talent that's going to want to work differently. I think it's a great perspective from a, from a company side. Sajan, talk about from a country's cultural perspectives and shifting that mentality. Similar things or, or different? Similar things. I think um, many countries, when we get into human capital development at a country basis, a standard question is, what does a future leader look like? Okay, so most of those organizations ask that question. And we have kind of distilled that down to five key things. Um, that we find from various countries. One is a leader has to, be, has to have collaboration mindset. It's a cliche, but you really have to do it. You have to have practices that actually prove that you're collaborative. When you have, when you're leveraging global talent, you need to have a people development mindset and skill to add on to collaborative mindset. Um, the third thing that's becoming even more and more important for leaders is to have, is to be digitally confident. Uh, that's very, uh, not very well understood, and that's important. Um, the fourth point that uh, we tell the folks is to be a global citizen. You know, you need to be comfortable going to different countries, being immersed in those cultures. And if you're not, you really can be a global leader. And really, if you look at the fifth part, is that 
Um, a leader must anticipate the future in some manner because most of these countries are futuristic because the past is past. They really can't do much about it. These are emerging economies. They're, they're future bound. Um, the countries, when you look at uh, how they are approaching this problem, one is in a political manner because it's a good thing to speak and good thing to do. Uh, they are approaching it from a uh, talent perspective. Some countries are, like Chile, like Singapore, uh, like now in Saudi. Uh, some of the countries are taking lead on it. So those countries are approaching it from a true talent perspective. They typically tend to have, a, at a national level, a human capital development organization. Uh, somebody which is very high up in the government focused on that. There is budgets, there are funds, sure. there are an, there's an operating mechanism. Um, the other thing that I find, three things that I find significant if a country has to move up in the world of talent, battle for talent. One is that you have to have a governance mechanism to develop talents. The second one is they have to refine their labor laws. I'll tell you this example. I was in Spain uh, uh, at the invitation of the Spanish government. We would like to go to Spain. It's a great market, but there are some labor laws that they have to work through uh, if companies have to come there and and it's just so obvious. But you know, sometimes um, politics over oversee something so obvious and fundamental. By the way, that's true in the US too. I mean, that's a whole other panel. Labor <laughs> laws absolutely do not know the way the world is going. And the third thing is just basic immigration laws. Um, equally, you can't have uh, global talent without talent mobility. Just not possible. Absolutely. And you cannot have free trade without global talent. So it's it just that that's what we observe. And, those governments that react to those three things are going to get ahead in the, in the battle. That's right. Well, we, we are just about at that time. Uh, so I, I want to thank uh, our panelists, not, not only for the time that you spent today, uh, but for leading the path in, in terms of helping uh, companies think differently, uh, to work differently, and, and to really attack this global competition for talent in a very practical way. Uh, which we know will, will great uh, impact for over time. So I hope you've gained some insights today uh, that can help you as we think about um, so many of these challenges that we face uh, across our globe uh, related to growing, uh, attracting, retaining, and ensuring competitive uh, multinational companies. So thank you very much and, and enjoy the, the rest of your day. Thank you.